So having learned about drift as a physical phenomenon, let's try to calculate drift current as an actual physical flow of electrons in silicon. So assume we have a piece of silicon and this piece of silicon is connected to a voltage source whose potential is V. Let's try to calculate the current that's flowing through the silicon and understand how this current flows. To do this, let's draw the band diagram of silicon when it is exposed to this external potential. The band diagram in this case is going to be tilted. It's not going to be constant like the band diagrams we have looked at so far. In fact, it's going to look like this. This is the valence band edge, EV. And this is the conduction band edge, EC. So we notice that both EC and EV are bending or tilting in the same way. They have tilted exactly the same way and they're moving parallel to each other. This is because they have to preserve the same band gap at all points across the uh, length of the material because it's all silicon, so it all has the same band gap. But why are EV and EC higher on this side than on this side? Because they are connected to an external source of potential and, uh, through the battery. And this source of potential has a value V. Let's just say that this is Vs. And so what Vs does is that it allows electrons that are on this side to have a higher energy than electrons on this side. Now there's something a little bit confusing here, which is that the negative potential side has a higher energy and the negative and the positive potential side has a lower energy. This is an unfortunate relic of the fact that potential is described for a, an imaginary positive charge carrier, whereas the real charge carriers are actually electrons. So let's consider what's actually happening here. What is happening here is that electrons that enter the material at this side will see a slope in the energy. This slope will allow them to go down because it's easier for electrons to go down, right? And so they will keep going down until they reach the other side. On the other side, they will exit the material, go through the wire and go to the voltage source. Now there is something, something has to raise their energy back up to the original level. And this something is the voltage source. So the voltage source will raise the electrons back again to this higher energy level where they can continue to slide down the slope of the conduction band and complete the cycle of flow of electrons through the material. Now, by how much is the conduction band edge higher on this side than it is on the other side? There's a very specific value for this. This is higher by QVS electron volt in terms of energy. So a voltage source of Vs will allow electrons to gain QVS electron volt. This is the definition of voltage. Voltage is by how much the battery can raise the energy of a charge of one coulomb as it crosses it. And this is exactly what's happening here. So there's another thing that's happening also, which is that holes are also flowing here. Remember that holes also move in a, uh, in a semiconductor. There is not a single uh, charge carrier. There are two charge carriers. The electric field that the, in, uh, uh, that the external voltage source creates is in this direction. This electric field causes the electrons in the conduction band to flow down in this direction opposite the electric field, but it causes holes that are here to go up, moving in the same direction as the electric field. As holes go up, they finally reach the edge of the valence band and they exit and they complete the cycle by going through the voltage source and coming back on the other side. But what this is suggesting is that it is easier for, for holes to go up than it is for them to go down. So for electrons, we usually assume, we always assume that they want to go down in energy. They want to rest at the lowest energy level possible, which is why electrons flow down, in, uh, down the slope. So holes, on the other hand, prefer to go up. We can think of holes as bubbles, and they prefer to bubble up in the valence band, which is why it's very easy for them to bubble up this way. Why is that so? Because remember that holes are not actually real 
particles. What's happening here is that electrons are flowing. Holes just mean lack of electrons. So in the valence band, electrons are moving down the valence band. As they move down, they displace the holes and cause them to flow up. So it is always easier for holes to bubble up through the valence band. Now we want to calculate the current, the current that is flowing in this case. And whenever we have a current that flows because we exposed semiconductors to an electric field, we call this drift current because the mechanism that carries the current is drift. So we said that in drift, what's happening is that when we expose an electron to um, an electric field, it's going to move at a drift velocity of minus mu n times the value of the electric field. Now, uh, velocity is also the rate of change of displacement, so it's dx by dt, so remember that. What is current? So let's imagine that we have a semiconductor of an arbitrary cross-section. What is current? Current is the amount of charge that flows through the cross-sectional area of the semiconductor per unit time. So it's dq by dt. And the question is, if we stand guard at this face of the semiconductor, at this cross-section of the semiconductor, and observe all the charges that manage to cross through it, how much charge do we count in one second? That is the drift current. And so if we imagine that this surface has a, an area of A, and, um, and it has a charge concentration of um, n times q, so it basically has n times q uh, electron concentration, then how many electrons manage to pass, how much, how much charge manages to pass in one second? So in one second, the charges that were exactly at the surface would have traveled a distance of Vn. So that's by definition, right? This is the definition of velocity. It is the distance that we travel in one second. So the charges that were just entering the surface after one second would have reached a distance of Vn. So the total charge that managed to cross the cross section within one second is contained within this prism, which is, uh, which is contained between the surface that has managed to travel Vn deep into the conductor and the surface of the semiconductor that we see, right? So it is the charge that is contained within this volume. This is the current. So if we manage to calculate this charge, it will be I. So I is going to be equal to N times Q, which is the charge concentration, multiplied by the volume. And the volume is going to be A multiplied by Vn, where Vn is the uh, length of this prism. Now, the charge density J, the current density J is equal to I over A which is equal to n times q times vn. So electron current density is going to be equal to minus n q mu n times e. But we also know that uh, current density is equal to conductivity multiplied by electric field. And so this finally allows us to see that the conductivity of the material through electrons is equal to uh, n q times mu n. So this is the conductivity of n-type silicon. But remember that there's also a hole component for current flowing, and it can be derived similarly as n as p times q times mu p times the electric field. And so the total current is going to be jp plus the magnitude of jn. And they're going to add up because uh, we know that even though electrons flow in the opposite direction of field, the two currents are going to add up. And so we have uh, P Q mu P plus N Q mu N, and it's all times the electric field, which means that the total conductivity of the material is equal to uh, P mu P plus N mu N times Q. And so we discover finally that the conductivity of the material is directly proportional and strongly dependent on the charge concentration in, uh, in the material. And therefore, because n-type silicon has many more charge carriers than intrinsic silicon, it is 
it has much higher conductivity and similarly for p-type silicon but not only that but the type of conductivity is also going to change because in n-type silicon the conductivity comes almost entirely from electrons in p-type silicon the conductivity comes almost entirely from holes in n-type silicon the, the major charge carrier the dominant charge carrier is electrons holes play a very insignificant role in p-type silicon it's the opposite and this contrast between n-type and p-type silicon is really what allows us to make interesting devices actually if you take um there's something of a curiosity here if you take the expression of uh, charge density which is equal to uh, sigma times e and you just expand charge the current density as i over a and you know for a linear electric field it's going to be v divided by l uh, what this is going to give you is that v over i is equal to l over sigma a which is the equation we know for uh, ohmic resistance and so all this proves is that a piece of silicon is actually an ohmic resistance but its resistivity or its conductivity is dependent on the uh, concentration of impurities that you put into it.